Hello everybody and good afternoon. You're all very welcome to the UCD History Summer School. My name is Roshi and I work in the College of Arts in UCD. I'm just going to introduce um, Dr. Declan Downey, uh, who is a lecturer in the School of History in UCD as well, and he's going to give you a lecture today about European strategists and statesmen of Irish origin. After that, um, we're, we're going to have a short discussion with uh, Rebecca Birmingham, who is a student here at UCD as well, a second year history student. Um, so if you guys could both just turn your cameras on, um, people will be able to see you now. Perfect. Um, so if Declan, you'd like to just get started there. Thank you very much, Roisin. And welcome everyone to this UCD Summer School History Lecture. And today I'm going to speak to you about European strategists and statesmen of Irish origin from 1600 to 1900 roughly. And it's just an overview, uh, an introduction for you to this aspect of Irish history and its connection with Europe. Very often when we think of um, our... Um, when we, there, can you see all of that? Yes, the three US presidents. When we think of our uh, connections um, with the outside world and where Irish people have done extremely well for themselves, everyone thinks of America and they all think of John F. Kennedy, the first great US president of Irish origin. But of course, there were other presidents of Irish origin as well, but they were all from Northern Ireland. There were Ulster Scots. But for someone to qualify as of Irish and Catholic, of course, John F. Kennedy is the one that comes to mind. And there you can see that lovely portrait of him by Norman Rockwell. And then I've also included uh, up there in the uh, top left-hand corner, that's President Ronald Reagan and underneath him, President Barack Obama, both of whom had Irish ancestors as well mainly from County Tipperary and County Offaly, respectively. And John F. Kennedy, of course, his links were with County Wexford. So people think of migration from Ireland to the United States primarily, where they did very well for themselves. They also think of Irish people who went to Australia or New Zealand or Canada or Britain it's really in the Anglosphere, the English speaking world that they think about. But I'm going to talk to you about another dimension in Irish history that's much older than the 20th century or indeed the 19th century. Because up until the 1840s, the period of the Irish famine, America was generally closed off to Irish migration. So where did Irish people migrate to? Where did they go? They went to Europe, primarily to France and Spain and Austria. And when you look at this list here that I put up on the screen in front of you, it might come as a surprise to discover that these Irish people held positions of great prominence, even rising to the rank of prime minister or president. For example, one of the first of these Irish people who became prime minister of the Duchy of Lorraine at the end of the 17th century, from 1684 up until 1704, was Francis Taff of Ballymote, County Sligo, and Carlingford of County Louth. He was a native of County Sligo, but his title, Earl of Carlingford, was connected with Louth. Then you had Patrick McEnany of Dunamoyne in County Monaghan. He was Secretary of State or Prime Minister of Austrian Habsburg Flanders, present-day Belgium and Luxembourg. And that was there in the early 18th century from 1724 to 45. Richard Wall Idevero of Kilmallock County Limerick was the Prime Minister of Spain under the Kings Ferdinand VI and Charles III in the middle of the 18th century from 1754 to 63. Edward Taff of Ballymote, a descendant of Francis Taff previously mentioned, he was Prime Minister of Austria during the 19th century, longest serving Prime Minister under Kaiser Franz Josef. 
and Leopoldo O'Donnell, Newport and Castle Bar, County Mayo and Ballyshannon, County Donegal, was Prime Minister of Spain during this period, in the late 19th century from 1856 right through to 1866. So these are people of Irish origin who occupied great positions of influence and power in the European principal powers of Habsburg Austria and Habsburg Flanders, the Habsburg Netherlands, under Bourbon Spain. And then let us look at the 19th century. Edmund Patrice McMahon of Kilmurray McMahon, County Clare and Dura Doyle, County Limerick, became president of France. He was president of the French uh, Third Republic, 1873 to 1879. And then, of course, before John F. Kennedy even rose to prominence in America, we had our own Charles de Gaulle, president of France from 1959 to 1969. He had originally been leader of the Free French from 1940 to 44 and chairman of the provisional government of the French Republic from 44 to 46. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, these are amazing figures from Ireland or of Irish origin who rose to great prominence in Europe. But Irish history for the 19th century and the 18th century and the 17th centuries are obsessed with Cromwell and persecution and famine and Fenians and failures and migration. But when you look at what was happening in Europe at this time, and particularly the rise of Irish people to prominence in Europe, it presents us with a whole new perspective on our understanding of Irish history and of Ireland's relationships with Europe. Now, the first great wave of Irish migration to Europe is generally associated with the wild geese. These were the Irish who had supported King James II in his war against William of Orange between 1688 and 1691. That war ended in Ireland with the Treaty of Limerick, which, as you know, was shredded as soon as it was written, uh, almost. And the great Patrick Sarsfield, who was the commander of the Irish Jacobite forces, Jacobite taking its name from the Latin Jacobus, meaning James, those who had supported King James, he was the leader of what we call the Flight of the Wild Geese, from October to November of 1691. Sarsfield saw the wild geese flying into their wintering in Ireland on the Shannon and on the Lee in Cork as well. And he and his followers vowed that like the wild geese, they would return to Ireland very soon and liberate it from the English. And so that term, the wild geese, was given to the subsequent waves of Irish migrants to France, to Spain, to Austria, to Bavaria, and elsewhere in Europe. So it's a collective term that we use. But of course, before Sarsfield even went, the Irish Brigade was established in the Army of France in 1690 by Justin McCarthy, Lord Mount Cashel. So this again is where you have so much focus on Irish military history, oh, the Irish Brigade and the French Army and the French service. But as we shall see, Irish military involvement with Europe predates the end of the 17th century. It predates Sarsfield, it predates Mount Cashel. It even predates this gentleman, Daniel O'Brien, the fifth Viscount Clare of Carrigaholt and Tarbert on the Shannon. And he was the great hero of the Battle of Ramiles. And he was a supporter of James II. And of course, subsequently, James III, James' son, took on the mantle of the Jacobite cause in Europe. And the Battle of Fontenoy is one of the great events that is remembered in Irish Jacobite or wild geese history. 
the 11th of May, 1745, Charles O'Brien, the sixth Viscount Clare, with his famous regiment of Clare's Dragoons in the Irish Brigade, saved the army of Louis XV of France from annihilation at the Battle of Fontenoy. Now, Fontenoy is quite famous. There have been songs and poems written about it. And of course, we even have GAA clubs in Ireland called after Fontenoy. But there you have Charles O'Brien, sixth Viscount Clare, and he becomes the first Irishman to be Marshal of France. Now, ladies and gentlemen, normally this is a post reserved for Frenchmen because the Marshal de France is a very special title given to the most senior, the highest ranking French military officer and commander. And Charles O'Brien is what the first, the second Irishman to become a Marshal de France was in 1816 and his name was um, Henry Clark. And he came from County Kilkenny, a place called Listowney, outside Kilkenny. And he became Duc de Feltre and second Marshal of France of Irish origin under Louis XVIII. And then you had the third great Marshal of France, and we will be looking at shortly, Edme Patrice MacMahon, who was from Dura Doyle and Kilmurray MacMahon, County Limerick and County Clare originally and he was Duke of Magenta, and he became Marshal of France in 1859 under Napoleon III. So the great battles of Ramilles and uh, Fontenoy, etc., these great Irishmen who rise to prominence in the French military, this is all indicative or significant of the role of the wild geese in France. And it is representative to a wider level of the role of Irish generals and officers in the armies of Europe. But lest you think it's all about soldiers and politicians, power was also exercised by the Irish emigres in Europe at this time, and particularly so by this elegant lady that you see in front of you, Louise O'Murphy, whose father came from County Cork. She was the petite maîtresse of Louis XV, specially chosen for the king by his prime mistress, or maîtresse en titre, Madame de la Pompadour. And this is a lovely painting of her by Francois Boucher, painted in 1751. Proximity to the king, ladies and gentlemen, guaranteed influence. And especially if one had the special confidence of the king, like Louise O'Murphy. So you see, power is not just only exercised on the battlefield, but also in the court itself, in the royal bedroom. Now let us go forward in time, back to the 17th century. Because as I've said earlier, Irish migration to Europe and engagement with the European powers predated the flight of the wild geese of 1691. As early as 1580, there were Irish companies of troops fighting in the service of Habsburg Spain against the Dutch rebels and against various other powers, including France in Northern Europe. But in 1605, 1606, you have the formal establishment of full Irish regiments in the service of Spain. Principally, the regiment or the tercios that were called of O'Neill, mainly drawn from Tyrone in uh, Northern Ireland, O'Donnell, Tyrconnell, Donegal, Sligo, that area, Fitzgerald, who was from Kerry, and he brought in quite a few from North Kerry, West Kerry, and Limerick and North Cork. Preston, who was from County Meath, he brought soldiers in from that part of the country, up in the northeast, Meath and Louth and North County Dublin, part of Kildare. And then you had the personal regiments of Owen Roe O'Neill and Owen O'Donnelly, 
these were mainly drawn again from Ulster. In the 18th century, these ancient Irish regiments in the Spanish service were converted and they uh, were um, reformed into the famous regiments of Hibernia, which means Ireland, Ultonia meaning Ulster, Limerick and Clonard. So again, people from areas connected with the traditional clans like the O'Neills or the Prestons or the O'Donnells or the Fitzgeralds, they tended towards these regiments and joining them. So there's a strong regional representation of Irish people in those regiments. I had mentioned earlier the famous Irish Brigade in the service of the French army that lasted from 1690 up until 1792. And again, when you had the restoration of the French monarchy in 1815 under Louis XVIII, uh, the regiments were um, reinstalled there and they lasted in France up until about 1830. So, you have the regiments of Clare, Berwick, Galmoy, Sheldon, Dillon, and Lally Tollendal. Clare tended to recruit mainly from northwest Munster. Berwick, mainly from throughout the countries, indeed. Galmoy tended to recruit mainly from the Kilkenny, Carlow, Tipperary area. Likewise with Sheldon, he came from there too, up into Kildare, Carlow. Wicklow, that area. Dillon tended to recruit mainly from Roscommon, East Mayo, Sligo, Galway, that area. And Lally Tollendal, mainly from Galway and Connemara, Mayo. Then in the service of Austria, you had going right back into the Thirty Years' War of the 17th century in the 1630s, regiments of Butler, mainly from Tipperary, and North Munster and uh, Kilkenny. Brown, which mainly came from County Limerick and North Kerry. Devereux from Waterford, uh, South Tipperary, East Cork and uh, Wexford. And O'Donnell, which mainly drew from Sligo, Donegal, North Mayo. And then there was the Cavalry Regiment of Walsh, which mainly drew its men from uh, South County Dublin, North Wicklow, and uh, East Kildare. So, and then in Bavaria, you had the uh, regiments of Butler, also drawn from mainly counties Tipperary and uh, East Clare and uh, Carlow Kilkenny, and the regiment of Hunning O'Carroll, which mainly drew from the Midlands around Offaly, Leash, that area. So you can see, ladies and gentlemen, there's a fairly wide uh, geographical spread of um, Irish people coming into these regiments. And these regiments were in the vanguard. They were the elite forces because they were so good at hand-to-hand -hand fighting. So that sort of um, uh, close combat, as it were, was necessary, particularly in taking cities and sieges or in um, organizing a rout of the enemy. And the Irish were famous for close combat, as they were for horsemanship. And uh, these are great um, assets for any military establishment. And the great powers of Europe availed of them. Now, when we look at the first generation of Irish statesmen during the 17th century, the first that comes to mind is Domingo de Rosario O'Daly, or Dominic Daniel O'Daly, he was a Dominican priest. He came from Kilsarkin in East Kerry, and he was the ambassador extraordinary and effective foreign minister and president of the Privy Council of King John IV of Portugal between 1640 and 1662. And Dominic O'Daly was the one who had negotiated recognition of Portuguese independence from Spain, and particularly getting French and papal and Dutch and even English recognition of Portugal. And when you're enjoying your uh, marmalade and your tea and your coffee in the morning over breakfast, give a thought to Dominic O'Daly because of him you enjoy those things because he was the one who 
organized the marriage alliance between Charles II of England and Ireland and Catherine de Braganza of Portugal. And part of her diary was bringing Tangiers and Bombay into uh, the British realm. And that's where you had the beginning of the British Empire and the introduction to the British table and the Irish table indeed of that lovely Portuguese uh, confection called marmalade. So, and we'll be coming back to these little nuggets of uh, useless information for the breakfast table as we go forward. So there's an Irish connection there. Francis Taff was Chancellor, later Prime Minister of the Duchy of Lorraine. Oliver Walsh of Carrick Mines in County Dublin, who was the commander of that cavalry regiment I mentioned earlier. He was Privy Councillor of the Emperor Ferdinand III in the Holy Roman Empire, the German nation. Dermot or Dermizio O'Sullivan Bear was Councillor of State and War to Kings Philip III and Philip IV of Spain. And John Andrew Hamilton, one of my own ancestors, was president of the Imperial War Council under the emperors Leopold I and Charles VI in Vienna. Now, president of the Imperial War Council means you are the defense and war minister. And Francis, uh, sorry, Julius Francis Xavier Hamilton was member of the Imperial Aulic Council, which is the highest court in the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation and he was president of the imperial courts of justice under the emperor Charles VI. And there you have an image of Donald Calm O'Sullivan Bear. He came from the Barra Peninsula there near Bantry in southwest Cork. He was a member of the Spanish Council of War, founder of the Royal Irish College at Santiago de Compostela in Spain. So you see, alongside the military, you also had the academic with the foundations of various Irish colleges throughout Europe. But we will, that's a subject for another lecture and, uh, and that, but I just want to mention it there for you and flag it. There is the famous Dominic O'Daly, the ambassador extraordinary of Portugal, to whom we can all thank for bringing us marmalade and coffee and tea. And there's P Oliver Baron Walsh or Valis of Carrick Mine or Carrick Main, uh, Carrick Mines in Dublin. Uh, it's a lovely uh, ink portrait of him. So you see these figures did exist and we have portraits, we have lots of documentation about them and their careers, etc. And of course, getting on in the European courts meant you had to have a serious patron among the great imperial or royal families of Europe. And one of the greatest patrons of the Irish in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries was this gentleman that you see here, uh, the great Prince Eugene of Savoy, or Prince Eugen von Savoy. And among his protégés were Francis Walsh or Franz Wenzel. You will see there on the screen the Germanicized forms of the names. As you will see, there are French forms of names or Spanish forms of names. This is an indication of how the Irish quickly assimilated into their host societies. The Irish who went abroad, ladies and gentlemen, had Latin. That was their formative language in the hedge schools of Ireland, Latin and French. And we have various accounts from travelers in Ireland in the 17th century or even in the 16th century, speaking of the ability of Irish country people in Latin and in French, and some in Spanish. And what you see there are the names Germanicized, but also if you look there at Franz Wenzel Walsh or Graf Wallisch von Karik Mine, Knight of the Golden Fleece. The Golden Fleece was the most prestigious chivalric order in Europe, still is. And these Irish people are gaining access into these orders, but they're also using Germanicized forms of their names and they're commemorating their Irish origins in their titles. Graf means Count, Count Valis von Carrick Mine, Walsh of Carrick Mines. Or for instance, Field Marshal Maximilian Ulysses von Braun. He's described there as Reichsgraf or Imperial, Count Braun de Camus, Camus und Monte Ani. Camus 
is in County Limerick. It's the South County Limerick around uh, Rathkeel, Newcastle West, stretching down onto the borders with North Cork. And Monte Ane is Knock Aene, the Vale of Aene there in Southeast Limerick, uh, wonderful rich countryside. So he's Brown, uh, who um, came from that area and his father before him, he's very much keeping alive the ancestral lands in his imperial German title. Uh, likewise, Patrick McEnany, or McEnany, he was the effective foreign minister and later secretary of state or prime minister of the Austrian Habsburg Flanders, the Austrian Netherlands, present day Belgium and Luxembourg. And he was uh, known as Baron McNaney von Donnermoyne. Donnermoyne is in County Monaghan, and that's where he came from. Or William O'Kelly of Ockram, who was the Imperial Poet Laureate of the German Empire and Grand Herald of the Holy Roman Empire between 1707 and 1743. So these are just some of the great figures from Irish history and of Irish origin who make it really big in the Premier League of uh, Imperial German society in the 17th and 18th centuries. And I've just put up there some other names uh, just again. And when we look at the 18th century, the second generation of Irish statesmen and strategists in Europe, Patrick McEnany, as I said, was uh, between 1700 and 1724 a foreign minister. And later he was prime minister or secretary of state of the Austrian Netherlands. Austrian Habsburg Flanders between 1724 and 45. His son, also Patrick, became the private secretary of the Empress Maria Theresa, that great figure of late 18th century Austrian history. Then you had James Fitzjames Stuart, Duke of Berwick, Liria i Alba. He was counselor of state and of war and was ambassador extraordinary of King Philip the fifth of Spain. He described himself as of Irish origin through his mother. His mother was Honora Burke. She had been the widow of Sars Patrick Sarsfield and she remarried um, James Fitzjames, the illegitimate son of James II. But she, but he, her son, James Fitzjames Stuart, he didn't want to associate himself with the English or with the Stuart monarchy in exile. Uh, so he describes himself as the Nation Irlandes, or of the Irish nation, through his mother, who was a Burke of Clan Rickard in East Galway. Richard Worley Devereux, whose uh, father came from Kilmallock in County Limerick. Again, he takes the title of Count uh, uh, Worley Devereux de Kilmallock. And he was a Secretary of State or Prime Minister of Spain between 1754 to 1763, a uh, great reforming figure in Spanish history. And John Thomas O'Donoghue of Glen Flesk in County Kerry was President of the Court of Justice and Notary General of Brabant in the Austrian Netherlands or Habsburg Flanders. William O'Kelly of Ockram, as I mentioned in East Galway, was Imperial Poet Laureate and Grand Herald of the Holy Roman Empire. And another Limerick man, Patrick, or sorry, Francis Morris de Lacey of Brewery. Everyone thinks of Eamon de Valera when they think of Brewery, but Brewery had an even more prominent figure in European history known as Francis Morris de Lacey. He was the president of the Imperial War Council under Emperor Joseph II. And it was his reforms of the Austrian army that ensured Austria was a great superpower in Europe right down until the First World War. And then, of course, in Portugal, uh, the Irish tradition established by Dominic O'Daly of Kerry was continued by the Tipperary men Michael Hogan, known as Galloping Hogan, Major General and Reform of the Portuguese Army under John V, and his brother Dennis Hogan, a cavalry officer and Major General, who was a close ally of the reforming Prime Minister, uh, the Marques de Bombal in restricting the powers of the Portuguese Inquisition. There, just under Philip V of Spain, again, the first Bourbon King of Spain, son of Irish origin, 
uh, there um, just some names. There's James Fitzjames, whose mother was a Burke of Clan Rickard in East Galway. There's a lovely portrait you can see of Richard Wall, or Ricardo Wally Devereux of Kilmallock. Uh, as I said, he was the first uh, of Irish origin to become Prime Minister of Spain. And when you look there at the various Irish people in the councils of state and war in Spain, like uh, Guillermo de Lacy or William de Lacy, he was a cousin of the Austrian Field Marshal, or General Felix O'Neill from uh, Newry in County Down, or John O'Neill Ivarela from the Fuse in County Antrim, or uh, the General Count Alejandro O'Reilly from uh, Cavan, and uh, he also had antecedents in North Meath as well, and the Brigadier and Captain General, as I said, Ricardo Wall Idevero, and you see there. So when you look at others in the Spanish councils, the Secretary of the Privy Council, for instance, and Council of State was Count John Rice from Dingle, or Field Marshal and Captain General, Count Bernardo O'Connor Faley from Offaly, or the Field Marshal, Captain General, Count Patrick Lawless O'Brien, who later became Spanish ambassador in London. Uh, again, these are people who um, have uh, uh, made it seriously well in terms of their advancement in their various careers as military figures, as governmental administrators, and as diplomats in the service of Spain. And of course, and then the, another uh, two carry men there, Count Dermot O'Mahony, who was ambassador of Spain in Vienna, in the 18th century, and General Count James Joseph O'Mahony, his brother, who was the army chief of staff in the kingdom of the two Sicilies, that would be Naples and Sicily. There's a fine portrait of O'Mahony. So when you go to Vienna, ladies and gentlemen, you will see this great monument to the Empress Maria Theresa, and around the base of the monument are some of her greatest field marshals and ministers, and some of them were Irish, and I've named them there for you, the Maximilian Ulysses von Braun, or William O'Kelly of Ockram, he was a nephew of the poet laureate, uh, Ockram County Galway, Henry O'Donnell from uh, Castle Bar in, and, and Newport in County Mayo, and uh, the Field Marshal Francis Morris de Lacy, whom I mentioned to you earlier. And as I said, Maria Theresa's private secretary was Patrick McNaney, son of the Prime Minister of that name in Austrian Netherlands. So uh, there you see again some of the names with their Germanicizations and the use of their um, places of origin. And the portrait there is of Maximilian Ulysses von Braun of Camus und Monte Eni. And there's the famous portrait of um, the great uh, uh, Francis Morris de Lacy, Imperial uh, War Council President or Defense Minister uh, of the Holy Roman Empire. And there you see the uh, title page or the facing title page of his Krieg's Exercitum, The Art of Warfare, a famous book which he wrote, which was um, uh, a great military manual, uh, which brought about great reforms in the Austrian imperial services and indeed in various other um, uh, military services throughout Europe. It was a bestseller uh, of the 18th century. Even Napoleon studied it carefully. And there you have two other figures. Uh, there's a, another George Brown, who was son of Maximilian Ulysses on the left, and on the right, John Sigismund Maguire. He came from Ballymacalligat in County Kerry. His antecedents originally came from Fermanagh, and he was, uh, again, one of the great figures of the 18th century Austrian experience. He was the one who forced Frederick the Great to defeat at the siege of Dresden. He was military governor of Dresden in 1757, and he was the one who obliged Frederick to pay reparations for the damage done to the city of Dresden by the cannonades. So uh, we can thank him for saving Dresden. Pity he wasn't around during the Second World War, but that's another story. 
Now, when we look at some of these names of Irish people, because I come from Kerry, naturally, I'm biased in favor of those Irish who came from my part of the country, Kerry and Limerick, North Cork and Clare, and that's why they feature so much in this uh, presentation to you today. But what I want to do here is draw your attention to look at the names. Look at names like Peter Julius Caesar McElligot or Ulysses McElligot. These are so classical. And this is, again, harking back to what I said earlier about the fluency in Latin and Greek, and Spanish and French among these people. They had a good classical education. And that's what they received from their private tutors, from their hedge schoolmasters, etc., in Ireland during the penal times. And it equipped them well for the academies in Europe, military academies, universities, you name it. Now, they had a great love of classical culture, and this is shown in how their parents christened them names like Peter Julius Caesar, or Ulysses, or Agathon, or Achilles, or uh, Aeneas. And even their daughters were given names like Dorcas, or Helena, or Athena. I'm not joking. Julia is a very important one as well. So, this is an example of the influence of classical culture, and it is that classical culture that allowed the Irish to integrate so well on the continent because the continent at that time also shared a common classical culture. And if you look down there, the names, and you see where they come from, I'll draw you there to the fourth name down, Hauptmann Thaddeus Ohasi von Dengen i Kusch. Now, I mentioned earlier marmalade on your breakfast table with coffee and tea, and how we can thank Dominic O'Daly from Kilsarkham for that. Hauptmann or Captain Tadeus O'Daly von Dengen i Kusch, on Dangen i Kusch, Oskelige, and it's Germanicized into Dengen i Kusch. So, anyone who says that Dingle's name in Irish is only on Dangen doesn't know their history certain former minister got caught on that some years ago, uh, but we won't go into the details of that now, but I leave it to your imaginations and you can check it out for yourselves. But anyone from Kerry and especially from Dingle will know what I'm talking about. At the siege of Vienna in 1683, the Turks, the Ottoman Turks had besieged the city for the second time and the city was under a great siege. And during that time, the city was under the governorship of um, Adam von Starnberg, but one of his captains was from Dingle. He was one of these Irish officers, and he had charge of the section of the city known as the Stephansdom Quartier. This is the area around the cathedral of St. Stephen, the Stephansdom. And when you go to Vienna, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to visit Café Heiner on Volzeilergasse, it's not that far from the cathedral, between the cathedral and the Donau Canal, or the River Danube Canal. And there uh, in the um, cafe, um, it's a conditorei and cafe, it's a bakery and a cafe, uh, Cafe Heiner. The baker, Herr Heiner, had been in his cellar. That's where he took shelter during the bombardment of the city by the Turks and he was making some bread with the meager supplies that he had there, and he heard scratching sounds coming from the wall of the cellar and realized that the Turkish sappers or underground engineers were mining a tunnel in under the city. So he alerted the local captain, Tadeo Sohasi. Hussi informed the governor, Starenberg, and Starenberg sent a flare signal up from the tower of the cathedral. That was the signal to the uh, Christian troops of King Jan Sobieski of Poland and Francis Taft of Carlingford, whom I'd mentioned earlier before he became Prime Minister of Lorraine, Charles of Lorraine and the famous Eugene of Savoy. And they were all up in the, the Kahlenberg Hills above Vienna waiting for a signal. When they knew when the city was in danger, they would attack. And on the 12th of September, 1683, as soon as that signal went up, thanks to McElligot and Herr Heiner, the baker, 
there was the famous Kahlenberg swoop and the combined Polish and German and Austrian and Irish troops came sweeping down from the Kahlenberg Heights, drove the Turks from the gates of Vienna and liberated the city. And as a result, the Emperor Leopold I uh, rewarded Hussey, of course, for his services, but he also rewarded Hussey's friend, Herr Heiner, the baker, by commissioning him to be the court baker and provider of cakes to the imperial court, and also to create a special breakfast bread called the croissant. Ladies and gentlemen, the croissant is called the croissant because it's in the shape of a Turkish crescent, the symbol of the Ottoman Turks, the crescent moon, and the folds in the croissant pastry represent the folds in the turbans of the Turkish Ottoman Sultan. And so this is Austrian, ladies and gentlemen. It is not French. It's not cuisine de France. It's österreichische Kücherei. So there you are. Now, you can have your croissant and you can think of Tadeus or Hussey and Herr Heiner, his friend, the baker, and you can spread your marmalade and think of that other Kerry man, the famous Dominic O'Daly of Kinsarkin, prime, the uh, foreign minister of Portugal. Let's proceed, because I'm anxious, of course, time is moving on, but even in church, uh, Irishmen like Maximilian Hamilton became Prince Bishop of Olmutz, and I want now to bring you to this great character of the early 19th century, Laval Graf Nugent von Ballinacarrow. Ballinacarrow in County Westmeath, ladies and gentlemen. And this young man of County Westmeath, at the age of eight, went to visit his uncles in Vienna. And he went into the military academy there, and he rose in the ranks to become uh, field marshal in the Austrian forces. But when he was a young man, uh, about 25, Napoleon invaded the Holy Roman Empire. And Laval Nugent, because of his ability in languages, became the Austrian military liaison officer with the Prussians and the British and the Swedes and others who ranged against Napoleon. And Laval Nugent was the one who drove Napoleonic forces out of the Balkans, out of Italy. He liberated Venice and he liberated Rome from Napoleon. And he was the one who escorted the Pope from his exile in France back to Rome. And for that, he was made a Roman prince. And he was given the Order of the Golden Fleece, which you see around his neck there, as well as the Maria Theresian Order. And on his breast, you see the Maltese Cross. He was asked what would he like as a particular title, and he asked for the restoration of the Irish title Prior of Ireland in the Order of Malta. And so those of you who may be familiar with the Order of Malta and its Ambulance Corps, there's a nice little connection for you. Now we go to this other figure. This is the famous Maximilian Graf O'Donnell von Larkfeld, Kastelbar und Tierconnell. Note again the Irish place names being kept alive in these families. And I should mention here that these families continued to have Irish tutors for their children. Even though they intermarried with the grand nobilities of the Holy Roman Empire, of Austria, of Hungary, etc they still had Irish tutors tutoring their children. And Maximilian Count O'Donnell was of the O'Donnells of Newport, Larkfield and Castlebar and Ballyshannon. There's two branches, the other branches in Spain. And he was the one who organized money for financing the publication and the printing of the annals of the Four Masters and various other great works of Irish history, which had been in manuscript form right up until the 19th century. And he was the one who came up with this idea, let's transcribe the manuscripts into modern Irish or English or French or German or Spanish and publish them so that we can publish these great sources of Irish history. 
and that's where modern Irish historiography took off. And there is O'Donnell um, having been made an imperial count by the Emperor Franz Josef because he saved him from assassination in 1849. And when you go to Vienna, another place you should visit is the Votivkirche on the Ringstrasse, which marks the spot where O'Donnell saved the Emperor's life. Now, I mentioned earlier, one of the longest serving prime ministers of Austria under Kaiser Franz Josef was this gentleman, Edward Taff of Ballymote and Carlingford. And there you can see him is a great reforming prime minister in Austria in the 19th century. And he was also a great reformer. And there is his son, Henry uh, uh, Taff, and that's a wonderful portrait by Victor Scharf, the imperial artist at the imperial court. So the Tafts have been very prominent in Austrian history, both as reforming prime ministers and ministers in government, as marshals, as generals, etc., judges, diplomats, etc. And they continue there until the end of the Austrian Empire. And it was around 1930 when they returned to Ireland. There is Leopoldo O'Donnell. He's the second prime minister of Spain of Irish origin, the Duke of Tetuan. And what I'm drawing your attention to here, ladies and gentlemen, is that 19th century Irish history, if you're looking at Ireland, it's frightfully depressing. Fenians, famines and failures. But if you're looking at it from a wider perspective, on the continent, you have Taff, of Irish origin, Prime Minister of Austria, O'Donnell, Prime Minister of Spain, and Edna Patrice McMahon of Kilmurray McMahon in County Clare and also of Dura Doyle in County Limerick, Duke of Magenta, Marechal of France, and First President of the Third Republic. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you might wonder, why don't we ever hear about this man? You've all seen, I'm sure, Andrew Lloyd Webber's great production of Les Miserables, based on the novel by Victor Hugo. And that, of course, is based on the famous Communard uprising in Paris in 1870. Napoleon III had been deposed following the defeat of the French by the Prussians and Bismarck. The German Empire had been proclaimed in Versailles and the... Uh, French had to uh, establish a new republic, which they called the Third Republic. Well, the man they elected in 1873 to be the first president of the Third Republic was this gentleman, the Duke of Magenta, Maréchal de France, Edna Patrice McMahon. And he was the one, ladies and gentlemen, who suppressed the communards in Paris and restored order there in the city. You see, it's an uncomfortable aspect of Irish history that some people don't want to talk about. But we are historians and we have to look at everything and every aspect and challenge things. Getting back to my beloved Austria, and there you have the Kaiser Franz Josef with his white jacket and his uniform, and standing beside him, the, gen the admiral there with the great uh, white plumes on his uh, admiral's hat, is Karl or Charles Freiherr Baron von Brady or Brady. Now, the Austrian Hungarian Imperial and Royal Navy, ladies and gentlemen, was originally established in Trieste, which is now in Italy. And it was established in the 18th century by an Irishman called George Forbes of Granard in County Longford. And the Admiralty of the Imperial and Royal Navy was mainly staffed by people of Irish origin, most notably the Bradys and the Connollys from Dublin, and the Coppingers, the Banfields, and the Barrys from County Cork. And these were the families that employed James Joyce as a tutor to their children when he worked in Trieste in the early 19th century, in the early 20th century. And there is uh, Admiral Brady with the emperor when he came to inspect the naval headquarters, the admiralty in 
Trieste. And one of the great admirals of the Austrian fleet, the Car und Car Kriegsmarine, was Alfred von Barry, who came from Cork. And there's a lovely portrait of him there. But I also mentioned the Bamfields. And here is one of the most famous of the Bamfields. Now, the Bamfields came from Castle Martin, Castle Lines in East Cork. They had served as officers in the Imperial and Royal Navy of Austria-Hungary. And here is Gottfried. And he was known as the Eagle of Trieste, the Adler von Trieste. He lived from 1890 until 1986, and I had the privilege of meeting him in 1983. And he was the architect of the naval air support, the World War I. He developed the prototype of what would become the aircraft carrier. After World War I, the Americans got plans and they developed the aircraft carrier from that. But Banfield was in fact the most decorated air ace of the First World War. Everyone thinks of the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, but Banfield was more decorated than von Richthofen and Banfield survived. He survived the Second World War as well and he lived and to ripe old age in 1986. He was even then, up to two weeks before he died, he was running his underwater salvage and marine engineering company in Trieste. A remarkable man. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, there you have two images. In the top left corner, you have the Maria Theresian order, which was established under the Empress in 1758. And this is the first promotion of knights in that order. And there's the Emperor Francis Stephen placing the collar of the order on the shoulders of John Sigismund Maguire, County Kerry, whom I'd mentioned earlier. And then in the photograph at Villa Wartholz on the 17th of August 1917, there you will see Banfield. Um, he is in his naval uniform. I can see it there on the I put the cursor there, there he is. And there is the emperor, the last ruling emperor, Charles. Now we come towards the uh, end sorry. of my presentation. Oh. Yes? Sorry, I should just say we're running out of time. So no, no, sorry. No, we can, we can, don't worry. There is the young Otto von Habsburg, who was of course the uh, father of the European Parliament that we all talk about. He died only a couple of years ago, but he was one of the great figures of the pan-European movement. He was the son of the last emperor of um, Austria and King of Hungary, Karl. And there he is with his preceptor or tutor, Georg Wallis von Karikmein, or George Walsh of Karikmein's, pictured at his father's coronation as King of Hungary in 1916. And Miklos Banfi in his book, The Phoenix Land, has a wonderful uh, passage describing that event and how uh, Valis von Karikmein uh, looked after the young prince. So as I said, all these Irish in the continent, they financed Irish cultural nationalism through co publications, conferences, artistic endeavors, the Annals of the Four Masters, for instance. They also financed the Irish race, racial um, conventions in Buenos Aires and in Paris. And they gave assistance to the first Doyle Aaron and the Irish Free State with diplomatic um, support in continental Europe, finding suitable accommodations, helping them get into various political networks, etc., and gaining recognition of independent Ireland. And notable among that would have been the Dukes of Tetuan, the O'Donnells in Spain, the Dukes of Berwick, Liri and Alba, and the Marqueses de la Granca. These are the O'Neills of the Fuse in Spain, the Condes de Machadas, the O'Neills in Portugal, and the, in France, the Dukes de Rohan, Chabot, Magenta, MacMahon, of course, and the Marquis de Goulen and the Bretoy. These are the O'Briens of Clare, and the Counts O'Donnell and the Tarks of Elishaw, the Walches of Carrick Mines, Nugents of Ballinacaro, the Banfields and the Colonel Bradys, all these families of Irish origin were very much involved in assisting independent Ireland gain international recognition in the early years of the state. 
Sorry, Declan, if we could just... The last, the last president of Irish descent was Charles de Gaulle. In case you don't know, his grandmother was one of the McCartans of uh, County Down. And there we have independent Ireland and Europe, and of course, Patrick Hillary and Gareth Fitzgerald, uh, former president and former Taoiseach, they very much acknowledged the assistance given by the Irish abroad to the emerging Irish um, independent Ireland. And there I finish with a quote by Seamus Heaney from the Republic of Conscience, where he captures this essence of these Irish people in Europe, as indeed everywhere else in the world, their embassies, he said, were everywhere, but operated independently, and no ambassador would ever be relieved. And that sums it up, ladies and gentlemen. All these individuals represented the best of their country abroad, and they didn't get relief, but they got honour. Now, there we are. Happy? <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Sorry to cut you off a little bit there at the end. I just wanted to make sure we got a chance to go to Rebecca because I know that a lot of students are uh, very anxious to hear about uh, this sort of student experience. Um, I'll just, sorry, I'll just change that there. Um, so Rebecca, maybe you could just give us a quick um, view on uh, what it's like to be a student and what it's like to study history at UCD. Yeah, sure. So um, if anyone's a bit nervous, you won't have to remember so many names. <laughs> I wouldn't worry <laughs> about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really varied. Um, there's plenty of Irish history, there's plenty of international history. I know someone asked, how recently does the course lead up? One of my modules this year, like we were talking about the protests in Charleston and stuff over the Confederate statues. So, I mean, it really covers a huge span. I was doing something that was looking at like Celts, Romans, Vikings this year. I've studied, you know, Russian history, Chinese history, American history, um, looking at Islam in the middle of East, you know, and then there is Irish history and Irish history is really, really different in college as well. I would say you do look at like social history and other roles. It's, it's not just all about, you know, kind of the various risings and stuff. So I think if, you know, if you're more interested in international history, you can absolutely choose the modules you want um, to go with that. And you can kind of avoid a lot of Irish history if you don't want to do it. But I would say I didn't like Irish history in school. And some of my favorites were some of the Irish history modules I did this year. Like we did one on social history in the 19th century and it was, it was amazing, so. So you'd say it's very different, I mean, because that's a question that a lot of students tend to have, especially about history, is they have a certain view of what it's like uh, to be studying it in school, um, but it's very different, I suppose, in, in college, or what's your experience been of that? Um, yeah, it definitely is very different in college. I'd say, like, for history, it's one of the courses that you don't have as many hours, but there's a lot of reading you have to do yourself, so you do have to be quite self-motivated. But um, I mean, there's just things you never would have touched in school that you'll learn. And um, I think like, you know, when you're in school, there's one kind of master narrative where it's, you know, one story, this is what happened in history. But when, you know, you're in college, you're looking at sources from different sides and propaganda and pieces that are like very obviously biased and how to recognize that. And um, so you're kind of learning out that actually, history in the same time period in the same country in the same city was experienced very differently by lots of different people so I mean I think that's quite interesting you're kind of looking at, at people that wouldn't have had any focus on them. Yeah, so it's a much more varied sort of version of, of history that you get um, a chance to have a look at. Yeah. Um, some of the other questions that are coming in here uh, how many hours a week are in classes and studies so how many hours do you think you, you probably spend I know that's a a loaded question with a course like history because there's so much is done outside the classroom as well. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe each semester this year I had maybe about 10 hours in college across the week. So I was actually only in college four days a week. But like I said, there is like, a, there's a lot of reading and a lot of work to do outside. So, I mean, you'd want to take that into account. It doesn't mean it's going to be a really easy course so that you don't have a heavy workload. Um, I mean, like for one week, for one module, I think the maximum we might have was like maybe 200 pages to read or something. Um, 
which is which is a lot that was only one module and then you're doing like kind of six modules per semester or whatever so to take that into account there there is a lot of reading and stuff and like it, it is really enjoyable things that you're looking at but you know there's a lot of work to do on your own because the hours are lighter yeah so that kind of touches off I suppose it's another question is um how much is it all another question that came in here do you have medieval history or, or do you have to do medieval history or ancient Irish history if you don't want to? No, you don't. So I did like Celts, Romans and Vikings this year and that was an option. There's a few modules that might be um, compulsory, but I mean, I do pure history. So our compulsory modules, there's only like seven of us in the class. Um, whereas like there's, there's loads of people in the lectures. I think I did Nazi Germany and there was probably about 200 people in that and then we were split into smaller groups that were probably maybe 10, maybe a few more. So um, you can really, really curate it to what you want to do. You don't have to do medieval history if you're not interested in it. I, I wouldn't particularly worry about that. Yeah. You really get to choose, especially I think as you go go through your degree in first year, you probably have a lot of, of general things just to give you a, a knowledge and a grounding. Would you say yeah. that's kind of been... And you get more modules as you go each year and they kind of build off things. So I did like modern China this year. And then next year, I know there's an option with the same lecture to do uh, Chinese feminist history. So it gets more kind of specific and tailored as you go. And there's loads more options and everything. Your classes get smaller and stuff. So it's really good. Um, there's a few questions coming in about what kind of module. So I've just put in a link in the chat to our brochure. If you want to click there, you can click through and find the history page and see a selection of of modules that are there. So we just have time for a few more questions. I think I might come to you again, Rebecca. Um, somebody says, is there a lot of writing in the exams? Um, so actually I'd say you more do essays at home. So most courses have a midterm essay that's usually about 1500 words. Um, and then you'll either have usually at the end of semester a 2000 word essay or a two hour exam where you answer two questions. Um, one from kind of usually the first part of the semester and one from the second part. Um, so you do have essays, but you're given the titles way in advance. You have loads of time to do them, so I wouldn't worry about that. And um, then you may just have essays or exams. And, you know, the exams aren't the same as the essays. You know, the essays, there's a lot of citations and stuff like that. You don't have to do that in the exam. You're just answering the question straight out. You can name a historian in it if you remember what their kind of thesis is but um yeah there is a lot of writing but again you get loads of time to do it and I wouldn't worry like if you just time yourself right you'll be you'll be absolutely fine and it's definitely a mix between like in semester assessments but you're not doing essays every week you kind of would have no you could have like I'd say I probably did two essays per module max um a semester so like you're not, you're not getting an essay every week, like what you're doing each week is you're doing your readings and then you're going into class and you're discussing them with your classmates and with the tutors and stuff like that. So um, you don't have an essay every week, don't forget. <laughs> and I suppose, what kind of skills do you think that you've kind of picked up from your time as a student? And history particularly? Um, yeah, well, like I think history is a really amazing course too. I mean, I'm now looking at masters and there's so many courses where they'll list the subjects that are really good feeders to go into them and history is almost always listed with so much stuff uh, because you know it, it informs everything about the world today it informs our kind of our social circumstances and our, our culture and our international relations and you can see that in other countries as well like you learn more and you're like oh that's the way something is so I mean it really you kind of hone your critical analysis and your critical thinking um, and you kind of you get used to picking up looking up biases and political opinions and I mean yeah just everything now like I, if you're voting in an election or you're you're watching the news or something you know you're constantly picking up biases or oh that's because of this or it's a, you know you now have the background and the reason why these ideals are the way they are it's 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 really good and obviously like your essay writing also <laughs> from a practical point of view gets a lot better as you go you kind of figure out what they want more and the feedback's always really good from the tutors and you can always meet them if you're if you're worried about that or if you want to find out after you write an essay what they liked or what they didn't mm. yeah and then just coming there oh yeah yeah right. no just taking on there from what rebecca has said 
uh, we like our students to develop their skills, transferable skills indeed, in research, in information analysis, in the ability to create an argument, etc. And these are very important skills. And many of our graduates go into careers in the law and history and law is a particularly lovely combination that many students take because the skill sets are almost identical in both disciplines. Many go on into diplomacy, into stockbroking, into high finance, etc. So there's a whole range of career paths open to historians and many uh, different professions like people coming with that historical perspective and analysis. So um, we have a, a recently established a History Alumni Association in UCD, which is headed by um, uh, the Supreme Court Judge John McMenamin, who was himself a historian, and by one of our great um, ambassadors, uh, Anne Barrington. So the thing is that, uh, you know, this is a great network for our students to tap into as well and to get to know people and, and as I said, follow those career paths. Um, our history courses embrace right across a range of histories, all different periods, medieval, early, modern, modern, contemporary, embracing all the different continents and cultures across the world because we are the largest history school or department in the country. And as I said, um, our graduates go on to great careers, mainly in law, diplomacy, stockbroking, finance, film production, um, um, you know, it's not all going into teaching or, or that. It's, uh, there are many other career paths and many go into the creative um, artistic world as well, bringing their historical experiences with them. So uh, con conservation, archives, librarianship, all of those things as well. So, you know, taking on from what Rebecca's saying, there are many opportunities with a history degree. It's not a useless, it's actually very, very fundamental. And um, as I said, uh, we have some great programs, history with law, for instance, history with economics, history with politics, and history with English. These would probably be the most popular groupings of subjects. But we also have pure history as well, if people want to just to do that. But fundamentally, it's a matter of reading. And you read, you research, you think about what you read, and you develop your arguments, you look at the various perspectives, and you present your case like a good lawyer in court in your essay. And these are the skills that you need. And these are what we develop in our students. And that's why they've gone all over the world and done very well for themselves. And we have a vibrant alumni association as a result. So there. <laughs> There we go. Um, so I think we might uh, leave it there. Unfortunately, I know there's still a few questions coming in, but I might just hand back to both Rebecca and Declan. So maybe Rebecca first, just a final word maybe on um, why why study history, why you liked it, because um, you are a pure um, history student, like Declan mentioned, that's one of the options. So maybe if you could just give us a final word. Um, yeah, so I suppose I'd say like I find I find UCD really great. Like I, um, this is something personal to say, but I have anxiety and depression. And um, so I was really worried about struggling with that. And there's so many really, really good supports in UCD. I'm registered with the Access Centre. There's loads of things like if you struggle with writing, if you're dyslexic, there's the Writing Centre. They'll help you. Like the tutors are so nice. You can go up to the matter class and just say, I'm struggling with this reading. Or um, can I just ask you a question about the essay? And they'll always email you back. They'll always talk to you. Professors always have. Um, like office hours and um, you can meet them like everyone's really really nice so don't be scared of anyone like it's it's a very open environment it's not like school um and I know someone said oh is it like learning things off and repeating the essay it's not like you do learn the subject and learn the day to get to know the people and everything but like a lot of it's analysis of it like it is it's very different than school um and it's it's great. I really love it. Like I went in originally in English and history, and I liked the history department so much and the way they taught and the modules that they had, that I streamlined to pure history. And they have even more interesting subjects you can do then that are like really hands on, like looking at the census, you know, doing research projects. It's um it's really great, and I really love it. I'd really recommend doing history. Um, even if you're just doing it with another subject. Like I know people that 
are now doing video archiving and like I know people who are in real estate and stuff that have all done history and like history of economics or, or a history with sociology and if you're interested in other subjects like in first year you can choose other modules like I've done social justice um, English psychology like I've done loads of different things so you can you can look at at different options that you can do modules and different courses as well to change it up or give yourself a little break if you think it's going to be too much history but um yeah there's there's loads and loads of support and it's it's really great everybody's really really nice in the history department like they're they're so good to get in contact with and get help so yeah that's really so like you've got an awful lot of options basically to do lots yeah. of different things yeah and uh, maybe the same to you Declan is there any yes the final word on history and studying history particularly at UCD um, that you'd like to Oh, I think sure. I've always said everything. <laughs> we, as I said, we have a great range of courses right across. I mean, you know, political, military, diplomatic, strategic, international relations, social, economical, cultural, religious, even history of medicine and of media. We do all of these things. And as I said, we offer a fantastic range. We're the largest in the country. We can do that. We have the resources to do it. And we have highly qualified staff from the best universities in the world to do it. So um, we offer a good program. And I suppose one of the things that all our graduates have said to us and about us is that we actually look after our students. Um, and Rebecca's touched on this, how approachable the tutors are and members of the academic staff are and the administrative staff. We have a very nice community in the history school in UCD. And we do look after our students and we treat them properly and treat them well. And we provide as much support as we can to them. And um, as I said, having a network of graduates that we can introduce them to as well is also very helpful to them. And they feel they're part of something bigger and um, it is helpful for them. So, um, you know, we allow uh, students, we teach them the skills, but we also allow them to develop themselves intellectually and to think clearly and critically for themselves and make their own minds up about things and have the intellectual basis to do so. So there we are. So there we are. Um, I know there's still a few questions. Um, unfortunately, we'll be able to get to them. I'm gonna try and- I'll get as through many as we can, okay? <laughs> I'll hopefully get back to you all um, directly afterwards. If you have any other questions that occur to you later, you can send a reply to the email that sends you the link. So that's hello.artshumanities at ucd.ie. So any other questions, you can go there. I've also put into the chat the, our link to our brochure. So I know a few of you had questions about careers. Um, there's a section on the back of that brochure all about careers. There's some history graduates there, people who go into law, people who go into media, a whole range of different things. Um, and then also a link to myucd.ie where you can get other course information and meet with other students. Um, so thank you all for coming and thank you for taking the time and um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Uh, Roshan, can I just answer one question? Oh yeah, of course. Someone just asked about um, kind of social distancing and stuff. The lessons have to run next year and I just want to say to everyone that I think history is genuinely one of the subjects that is best suited to the circumstances that are happening right now because you go to lectures they're very big. So you listen to the lecture and you see their lecture slides. So we've just had lectures recording their audio over the lecture slides they play. So it's basically the exact same. And you can do it at whatever time you want, whatever time suits you, if you have to work or if you have to take care of someone. And then with tutorials, we still had tutorials online. They were videos. So we were still face to face. We were still talking and the classes are generally quite small. They're usually from anywhere from like seven people to maybe like a max of 15, I think. Um, so it's still a very small group. And, you know, when you have to go into college, because the history classes are quite small, one-on-one -on -one tutorials, the rooms tend to be quite big. So you will be able to space out quite well. Like, obviously, no one knows exactly what's going to happen right now. But I genuinely think history is one of the best suited courses <laughs> to social distancing. And I've been in contact with all my lecturers. They're all really great. They were constantly checking in. They always replied to me. All my tutors replied to me. And I'm sure they were getting tons of emails. So like the department is handling it really, really well. Like at least it's not science where you have to do practicals and stuff. <laughs> 
just to say that in case anyone's worried about that because I know everyone is thinking. <laughs> if I could come in on there because we had yeah. a meeting by Zoom about this yesterday. Um, now, yes, we are prepared to uh, continue teaching through Zoom or online. We have many of our large lecture groups definitely by Zoom or online, certainly something like today. And that, but for smaller groups, then the tutorial groups, the seminar groups, they're much smaller, as Rebecca was saying, and that they will try to facilitate them on campus if we can. Um, you know, most of the rooms are large enough to allow for a group of 10 people to sit comfortably and at distance from each other within the, within the hall and observing the, the protocols. Now, um, I I suspect that um, that will continue into into uh, the next term, and that. But uh, we just have to watch uh, how things go over the summer, and that, and be prepared for for that. Um, but yes, we. Someone asked there in one of the questions about uh, is history studying history at college like doing the leaving cert? No. <laughs> So that's the takeaway. The first year, we will tell you to erase from your minds your leaving cert experience. We we have to deprogram people from the leaving cert. So, <laughs> um, so you, you will find it's an infinitely more pleasant experience. You'll be able to read on any topic that you want to read on, in you know, that captures your interest. And you read widely, you read well, and you discuss your ideas and what you've read with your tutors, etc. And you'll have nice, interesting essay topics to choose from. And in some cases, lecturers give their own uh, the students their own choice of an essay. A student might have read about something particularly interesting for them, and they might want to explore that further. It's all about developing your skills as a researcher, finding out information for yourself and comparing the different accounts, et cetera, and looking, weighing the evidence and assessing its quality and then formulating an argument. And there are skills in that and we teach the skills and it's up to the students then to find out the information that they want and put it all together into an argument and make a case. That's what it's about. But uh, secondary school, leaving cert mode program, you can forget about it when you come to college. And in case you're wondering, we don't have control over the curriculum in the Leaving Cert. <laughs> That's entirely under the control of the civil servants in the Department of Education. And even though they say they consult historians, they don't really take any notice of the advice <laughs> they're given. And that's not just for history, it's for every subject. So consider yourselves liberated. <laughs> And when you come to college, then it's a different story. So there you are. Yes. The takeaway, it's not the same as the leaving cert. Completely different. <laughs> OK. But thank you very much uh, for all of your time. Um, I really hope that you guys got a good sense of what it's like to study history at UCD. Again, like I said, if you want to send us any emails with any follow-up questions, just reply to the hello.artsumanity at ucd.ie email that sent you the link. Hopefully, we'll see you again soon. <laughs> <laughs>